Okay, so continuing on. Um, Ferdinand de Saussure was more interested in how language is constructed. Um, so he would, you know, his formula was a signified plus a signifier equals a sign. So the signified would represent like the thing being represented, the concept itself. So let's say a four-legged friend. Uh, the signifier was what represented uh, or represents that signified or the, the four-legged friend, which is could be the word dog, picture of a dog, the sound of a dog, um, and that sort of thing. However, that was kind of, uh, you know, when we this showed that the relationship between the signifier, the word dog, and the thing itself, the dog, it signified, you know, and it, it was completely arbitrary because in different languages the word dog is spelled differently and pronounced differently. And then we had um, Charles Sanders Pierce, and, you know, he was a little bit slightly different than Ferdinand de Saussure's concept. In his concept, it was the interpretant plus the representament equal the sign. So the interpretant was the four-legged friend. The representament was the what represented the four-legged friend. There were dogs, the picture of a dog, the sound of a dog. Um, you know, Pierce was more interested in how he made sense of the world around us. So his was a little bit different. Um, you know, it wasn't about just the user of the sign. He didn't feel that the sign was the same to all people. Um, so that mental concept was based on each user's cultural experience. Um, so the interpretant is not just a single define, definable meaning. That meaning has to be dependent on the reader of the sign. Uh, just like when we look at the American flag, uh, we think of it as a certain meaning to us. But does it have the same meaning to someone not from this country? Now, Pierce defined uh, signs into three categories. You know, he thought of it as symbols, um, icons, or index. Um, so a symbol basically was where the signifier does not represent the, or resemble the signified. Um, so that relationship has to be learned. In other words, the image doesn't look like what the meaning is. Um, and so unless we know that relationship or have learned before what that means, we won't know what it stands for or what it means. An icon is basically the this the you know signifier is resembling what it is signified um, or it resembling or in, imitating the signified so it's going to look like what the image is an index is where the signifier is not uh, directly um, you know laid out, but it's related or connected in some way, either physically or causally, uh, to the signified. So this link can be observed or inferred. So if we look at these, these are symbols. Unless you have a prior, you know, knowledge or understanding of the relationship or acculturation, we're not going to know what these are. You might recognize um, the, you know, female and the male uh, signs, but what these actually are are the uh, symbols of the planets from NASA. And there's an arbitrary relationship here between the signifier and the signified. The interpreter understands the relationship through previous knowledge. Here we have the peace sign. Most people recognize the peace sign, um, but very few people know where it actually came from. Um, this, you know, it's over 50 years old. It was invented back in 1958 um, as an emblem for an anti-nuclear weapons march in London by a, a British designer. And the symbol superimposes the semaphore signals for nuclear, 
and disarmament. And so that caught on worldwide and quickly became a universal touchstone for the causes of peace and nonviolence. So, um, but most people relate it to peace and understand that and know what that means. Here we can see the American flag. What does that represent in your opinion, in your, in your mind? And if we portray it in a different light or a different setting, how does that um, symbol change when it's represented differently? You know, all that is necessary for any language to exist is an agreement amongst a group of people that one thing stands for another. Um, our alphabet is a physical representation of sounds in our language, um, but only because the Phoenicians decided certain things meant a certain sound, um, and that carried over over generations and generations. And how do we know what these symbols mean or represent? You know, we're taught early from childhood um, that repetition goes into our long-term memory. And it all comes back to pictographs and the Phoenicians. And signs mean different things to different people. You know, we have different crosses here, plus signs. Um, we have the cross of St. Julian, the cross of St. George, the red cross, a no stopping sign, a positive terminal, a hazardous chemical or do not ring or do not smoke. Um, they all mean different things. Here we have the red cross uh, or red cross sign of Christianity, the red crescent sign, the red crystal. All of that is decades of stalemate stemming from the Jewish state's reluctance to display a cross or a crescent. Here we have um, the different um, symbols for that was adopted by early Christians. Some scholars say the fish was a pagan symbol, um, but the biblical references to, were to apostles being fishers of men. Um, and when we see it with the Greek writing, uh, that Greek writing means Jesus Christ, Son of God and Savior. You know, we look at this sign, the um, sign of Judaism, the Star of David. Um, its history goes way, way back. Its earliest known use was a seal in ancient Israel, 6th century B.C., um, we also have seen it in the 4th century synagogue frieze in uh, Capernaum with other religious and spiritual symbols. It's associated with the Kabbalah starting around the 6th century. Um, it was a Jewish printer's mark in medieval Europe. It was adopted um, in association with the Zionist movement late in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in ancient cultures, like in the bottom right corner, it was found you know, through Asia, through Mesopotamia and Mesoamerica. Uh, it was called the sun wheel, believed to be a mystic symbol for the sun or fire, or by extension, life and good fortune. The swastika, um, which is very notorious these days, and associate, we associate it with Nazi Germany, but it was used by the Hindus for 5,000 years as a sign of rebirth and uh, renewal changed over time. How do you think, you know, symbols change over time? Um, I mean, we can apply that to the Confederate flag um, and how that has been reconstructed into a new meaning by neo-Nazi groups and, and uh, white supremacists. Going back and see it. There we go. Okay, so... An icon, are these icons, are they symbols? You know, what, when we look at um, even our phone, you know, and look at the widgets, what are they? Are they icons, are they symbols, are they index? Um, usually we'll see a figure like this for the men's room. Um, 
But in some semioticians maintain that there are no pure icons. There's always an element of cultural convention involved. Um, like Kent Grayson, he's an associate professor of marketing at Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Um, you know, obviously this icon for the men's room does not look like an actual man, um, but we're looking at, you know, this, we're subconsciously filling in those gaps. Um, so it's a paradox of representation. It's deceiving us most when we think it works best because it's more simplified. And when we look at index, you know, we look at that connection physically or causally. You know, we don't see the hot air balloon in this picture, but we see the connection to it through its shadow. Or through the smoke here of the forest fire. Um, or the footprints in the sand. We see that connection. When we look at our iPhone apps, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, are they icons, symbols, index, a combination of all three? I love this Rene Magritte uh, poster. It says, this is not a pipe, um, which is neither true nor false. Um, if you look at it from a semiotic point of view, it's not the physical reality of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. It is the signifier for pipe, but not the pipe itself. In the viewer, we can also, you know, make signs in our mind's eye. We search for an association between images and their label. A simple change in labeling can make a harmless figure take on a more sinister appearance. And we also have unofficial versus official language. So here we have eggs. So think about this as an unofficial language. And then we also have eggs from Dunn's Egg Farm, Farm Stevenson's Office Park in New Jersey. So unofficial versus official language. <clears throat> 